Psalm 105. O give thanks to the Lord and call on his name. Make his deeds known among the peoples. Good morning and welcome to worship at First Presbyterian Church. If you are watching us via live stream, we are so glad you can join us. We apologize that it didn't work last week, but we trust that it will work better this week. We continue to record our services, and they'll always be available on our website, as well as available on KRAM Radio at 8.30 a.m. on Sunday morning. For those of you who are worshiping here in person, we appreciate your uh, cooperation with Sessions Call for us to wear masks during the worship service. We'll be sending out these announcements via our website, and as well, we encourage you to pray for the people on our prayer chain. Today, we'll be having our congregational meeting immediately following this worship service at 11, and you'll be able to participate here in person, or if you're joining us via live stream, you'll switch over to a Zoom meeting for that congregational meeting and our fellowship time. If you didn't receive that link, the link number for Zoom is 834-5395-6721. Today, we continue to support the day of giving efforts in our community. We'll be offering a drive through collection where you can bring diapers and new underwear and bring your donations starting at 11.30 in our parking lot and you can drive through and donate them for the Community Day of Giving. We also want to invite you to contribute to the needs around the world. Particularly, we invite you to donate to the fire needs in California for relief for the firefighters and also to those affected by the hurricane in the Gulf Stream. So if you want to send in your donations to our church, marking them for either hurricane or fire, we'll contribute them or distribute them through the Presbyterian Disaster Assistance Program. Pastor Diana, do you have birthdays and anniversaries for us? Yes. Good morning. It's good to be back with you after being gone for a couple of weeks. And I'm delighted to, that we are celebrating um, birthdays this week with um, Sheila Lutz. Bishop Lane, Marlene Sidwell, Elsa Arnson, Jacob Finn, Donald Mason, Virgil Payne, Adrian Crater, Deanna Dykeman, Linda Stratton, and LaVon Beardsley. Happy birthday, everyone. <laughs> Did we miss anyone's birthday that's here with us this day? Are there any anniversaries you'd like to announce this morning? join me in the call to worship. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the nations. Who will not fear you, Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you. The Lord's righteousness has been revealed. Let us pray. O oh God, our constant love reaches to the heavens, and your faithfulness extends to the skies. Your righteousness towers like the mountains, and your justice is deeper than the sea. Send your Holy Spirit, that in our worship we might experience your light and grace. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.
when we see God's beautiful holiness, we recognize our own lack of holiness. God is light and truth, yet we live in darkness. People of God, let us acknowledge who and whose we are. Let us ask God to illumine us with grace and truth in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Please join with me in the prayer of confession. Merciful God, in your gracious presence, we confess our sin and the sin of this world. Although Christ is among us as our peace, we are a people divided against ourselves as we cling to the values of a broken world. The fears and jealousies that we harbor set neighbor against neighbor and nation against nation. We abuse your good gifts of imagination and freedom, of intellect and reason, and turn them into bonds of oppression. Lord, have mercy upon us. Heal and forgive us. Set us free to serve you in the world as agents of your reconciling love in Jesus Christ. And now let us take a moment for silent personal confession. Amen. Now let us hear these words of assurance of pardon. God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Please join me in the prayer for illumination. We pray, Lord, that you will open the door of our hearts to receive you within our hearts. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Today our scripture comes from Exodus, chapter 40, verses 16 through 21 and 34 through 38. Moses did everything just as the Lord had commanded him. In the first month of the second year, on the first day of the month, the tabernacle was set up. Moses set up the tabernacle. He laid its bases and set up its frames and put it into poles and raised up the pillars. As he spread the tent over the tabernacle, he put the covering over the tent as, it, as the Lord had commanded Moses. He took the covenant and put it into the ark and put the poles in the ark and set the mercy seat above the ark and he brought the ark into the tabernacle and set up the curtain for screening and screened the ark of, of the covenant as the Lord had commanded Moses then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the God <clears throat> of the Lord filled the tabernacle Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled upon it. The glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. <clears throat> Whenever the cloud was taken up from the tabernacle, the Israelites would set out on each stage of their journey. 
But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out until the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day, and the fire was in the cloud by night, before the eyes of all the house of Israel at each stage of their journey. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. passage this morning comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 14 to 16. These are familiar words to you. Listen now to the word of God. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one after lighting a lamp puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. The word of the Lord. If there are children in the worship service this morning, we invite them to come down for the time with children and sit right on one of the X's here in the front row. Go ahead, you'll find an X right there. Go ahead and have a seat right there on one of the X's. Good morning, everybody. 
During our last several months, we've all missed seeing the children most of anything as we worship. Let us pray. O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of every heart here be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, today we'll be continuing our sermon series on our church's mission statement, keeping the mission that God has given us squarely in front of us. You'll find our mission statement on the back of your bulletin, and I'm going to ask you to turn to that mission statement on the back of your bulletin, and would you join me in reciting it together? As followers of Jesus Christ, under the authority of the Bible, our mission is glorifying and worshiping God, baptizing and strengthening disciples, loving and serving all people. Today we'll be looking at the glory of God and what it means to glorify God. In the 1990 movie Glory, it's the true story about the 54th Massachusetts Infantry Regiment, one of the first black regiments of the Union Army that fought during the Civil War. This regiment received glory because of how valiantly they fought at the Battle of Fort Wagner in South Carolina. The trailer for the movie, movie summarizes their sacrifice. It said, they fought for freedom, 
they found glory. These men received glory because they sacrificed themselves for the freedom of others. The actor Morgan Freeman said this movie was perhaps the most important movie he was ever in. It's important to recognize the great things people have done, especially when done at great sacrifice to give them glory. Well, the story of the Bible is about the great things that God has done for humanity. Max Lucado, the Christian author, wrote this, quote, God's glory is the big news of the Bible. It's all about God's glory. Well, our first mission in our mission statement is to glorify God, to give God glory. And as we will see in our scripture today, we glorify God by letting God's glory, God's light shine in us and through us, through our good works that we do in Christ's name. Our mission statement echoes the mission of humanity as described in the Westminster Confession of Faith. The first catechism question is this, what is the chief end, highest end, of humanity? And you're familiar with the answer. Humanity's chief and highest end is to glorify God and fully to enjoy him forever. The challenge is, how do we glorify God when we can't see God? You know, if seeing is believing, then we have a major obstacle in our faith. We are unable to see God. We are blinded from God by design and by circumstance. It's by God's own design that from the time of creation, God has been heard by us, heard by humanity, but not seen. When Moses approached God on the mountain of Horeb, he hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. The circumstances of our world has blinded us from seeing God. The darkness that has engulfed the world hides the light of God from the world. So to give the, God, the people of God a visual image for their faith, God has revealed himself to humanity through the appearance of God's glory. The Exodus passage that Nikki, Nikki read this morning describes the construction of the tabernacle for God's people as they were journeying across the desert after they left Egypt. The context of Exodus always helps us understand more about the passage. Here was a group of people, people better than told, had been told that they were the people of God, but they had been living under slavery in Egypt. The only thing they had seen during their time there was the cruelty of the pharaohs and the pagan images of the Egyptian gods. So then this man that God calls named Moses has secured their release from the Egyptians, and they are on a long and difficult journey to the promised land. They may be looking forward to the land flowing with milk and honey, but they are traveling through a barren wasteland. It's a difficult task for them. So to give them faith for their journey, God reveals himself by revealing his glory. The first verses that were read describe Moses setting up the tabernacle. Now their tabernacle was quite large and had many poles to set it up. The image that comes to my mind when I read this scripture is like Moses is setting up a tent for the first time whenever he's going camping. You know those tents that have like a hundred poles that have to be put together just right? I can just imagine Moses reading the instructions while the ever so cooperative Hebrews help him. Let's see, pole A goes in hole F and supports panel 34 for the east side of the tabernacle. Well, after putting up the tabernacle, Moses puts the Ark of the Covenant into the tabernacle. Once it's set up, God's glory arrives. We read in verse 34 how the cloud covered the tent and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. To give his people something to see, God was present to them on their difficult journey, present with them in a cloud by day and a fire by night. God himself cannot be seen, so God's radiance appears in cloud and fire. The first thing to notice is that God's glory is the visible sign of God's presence. The cloud of God's glory was the original GPS, God's positioning service. 
When the cloud was on the tabernacle, the Hebrew people did not move. They did not set out until the day was taken up. And then when it was taken up, the Israelites would set out on the next stage of their journey. God guided them along this long and difficult path they were on. Now, as important as it was that the Israelites to God was guiding them, it was just as important to know the faithfulness of God. God had brought them out of Egypt. He was leading them to the promised land. But God, they were not there yet. And the promise of God's faithfulness would help the, the, the Israelites. God had not abandoned them, is what he's telling them, by his glory. To a people who were on the move, who had no home, who were unsettled, unsure, God is glorified by God helping them along the way on their journey. God's presence is a powerful sign of God's covenant. God said he would be their God and they would be his people. And now God is showing his faithfulness in keeping that promise. We can consider ourselves on our own journey to the promised land. Though more spiritual than geographical, we too have been set free from slavery. Set free from slavery to sin and through Christ, we are on our own pathway to God's kingdom. Along the way, we have a mission. We have a mission to see God's glory and to reveal God's glory, to glorify God and to enjoy God forever. This is our chief and highest calling. Well, to fulfill our mission to glorify God, we first have to see God's glory. You know, when we consider that response to the Westminster Catechism, to glorify God and to enjoy him forever, I'll admit that that second half, to enjoy God forever, has always puzzled me a little bit more than the first half, to glorify God. What does it mean to enjoy God? Dennis Hollinger, a professor at the Messiah College, wrote an article about how to do both. He writes that to enjoy God is, quote, to focus on all the good things that flow from our faith in Christ as Savior and Lord, unquote. In other words, we enjoy God by seeing and recognizing the benefits we receive from having faith in God, from God's grace, from our salvation. Hollinger lists four things that we receive. First, the forgiveness of our sin. We get to enjoy knowing that the sins we have committed, the mistakes we have made, are not held against us by God. We are forgiven of our sins. The second, he says, is the presence of the Holy Spirit. We get to enjoy God's Holy Spirit being present in our lives, guiding us along this path that is before us. Third, he says, personal meaning. We get to know and enjoy knowing that our life has a purpose bigger than ourselves. I saw an advertisement for an ice cream shop recently that caters to their customers, and the, on the ad it said, quote, it's all about you. Well, in contrast, when Rick Warren wrote his book, the, book, the Purpose Driven Life, his opening sentence was this, it's not about you. We enjoy that the purpose of our life is about God, is bigger than us. And finally, we enjoy the hope of eternal life. Now we get to see God's glory dimly. Then we will get to see God's glory fully in God's kingdom. To recognize God's blessings upon us, it will lead us, as the Westminster Catechism states, to fully enjoy God forever. When we see and enjoy God's glory in our lives, we can then glorify God. But well, once we're aware of God's blessings and we can fully enjoy God, we are called to fulfill our mission to glorify God. Christ established his church to do just that, to glorify God. Jesus was sent into the world to know, to, so we could know that God was present with us. And he did this by revealing God's glory. The prologue to John proclaims, quote, the word became flesh and lives among us, and we have seen his glory. He was the source of life for humanity, and he brought light of God to the world. 
In John 9, chapter verse 5, Jesus said, As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Jesus said this in the middle of performing a miracle. He was healing a man who was born blind. It's a powerful symbol. Since the world cannot see God, Jesus opens a man's eyes who was blind to see and reveal God's glory. Now our eyes have been opened to see Christ. As long as Jesus was in the world, he was the light of the world. But now that torch has been passed on to us. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. As disciples, God's light now shines through us. The first thing we learn from the passage in Matthew is that God has not given us this light to be hidden. Now Jesus sort of states the obvious here. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a bushel basket. If you're going to light a lamp to spread light, you don't try to then dampen the light. You put light on a lampstand for the whole house. God has put his light in us for the whole world to see. The reason God put his light in us was to share so that the world could know that God is present and faithful. As the glory of God filled the tabernacle to show the Israelites God's presence, so the light of God has been placed in us, his church, to demonstrate God is present to the world. Think about that. That's pretty amazing. God's glory is now in his church to reveal God's glory to the world. We are now the demonstrators of God's presence to the world. We are facing some challenging and difficult times in our world now. The world needs to see God's glory. Well, God's glory is revealed through the church serving the world so that they can see that God is present with us. Christ called his church to reveal God's glory through their good works. He said to his disciples, let your light shine before others that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. In this verse, Christ gives us a purpose, a plan, and the power for our good works. The purpose of our good works is to give glory to God in heaven. It's a common misconception amongst the world and amongst some Christians that we behave the way we do and we do good things to earn God's blessings, to earn God's favor, to earn our eternal life. But this passage helps turn that around. Our good works are not to give us glory, to boost us up. Our good works are for the glory of God. They're through the result of knowing God and our good works are to give God glory. This passage also gives us a plan. And that plan is simple, to do good works for others in Christ's name. And by doing that, we're reminding them that God is with them in the midst of their difficult journey. You know, when doing good works, we're not only fulfilling our mission to glorify God, we're also fulfilling our mission to become disciples. Mother Teresa said this, quote, If we do the work for God, for his glory, we'll be sanctified. Finally, we have the power to do good works for God through the light that God has given us in Jesus Christ, the light of God that is shining through us. It's the Holy Spirit. When God came upon the disciples at Pentecost, he gave us power to do God's work through good work. The mission Christ gave his disciples was to glorify God through their good works, and Christ's mission now continues through our mission our mission as followers of Jesus Christ to glorify God. It's a mission that our church is called to do, and it's a mission that we are called to do as individuals. Today, this church is fulfilling that mission in many ways. Today, this church will help feed and house families who have no home. Today, we'll be gathering items of clothing for the Day of Giving mission. This church regularly serves meals at the Camilla shelter, First Presbyterian Church sent money to other churches in Wyoming who were suffering because of the pandemic. This church has helped fix homes in Puerto Rico. This church has dug fresh water wells in El Salvador, in Nicaragua, and in many other countries around the world. This church built a ramp 
and some steps for a church member. Another time, this church helped move a church member's mother to her new home. This church has helped build homes for Habitat for Humanity, has repaired homes through Brush with Kindness. This list could go on and on. And I don't mention this list to give ourselves all a pat on the back, but it's to remind you that you are doing the work of God. You are revealing God's glory to the world through all the work you do. You're also fulfilling the church's mission through your own individual volunteer work that you do. Some of you help at Friday food bags. Some of you help deliver meals on wheels. Some of you help at the St. Joseph's Food Pantry. One of you delivers blood to hospitals in their time of need for surgeries. Two of you mowed a member's lawn who was recovering from surgery. And one of you, while I was writing this sermon, rescued my wife and daughter when our car had broken down. Last year, as part of our 150th anniversary celebration, we tracked the number of volunteer hours our church members do, and the number greatly exceeded the 150 hours that was our goal. For all the good works you, the church, the body of Christ, and you as individuals do, good job. Good job and keep working. The mission of the church will never be completed until Christ comes in his glory. God's glory is the visible sign of the world through us. Through us that God is with us. God is faithful. Our mission is to let God's glory shine before others that they may see God's glory. Our mission is to continue the good works that we do as a church and as individuals so that others may know God is present and God is faithful and that God loves them. Amen. Now to join with me in a confessing what it is we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, 
let us come to the Lord in prayer. Blessed God, we yearn to see your vision of justice, love, and peace made real for all people this day. Open our eyes to the way of love, that we may see your brilliant light shining into the hidden places of our hearts and the darkened corners of the world. Almighty God, through the testimony of those who know your love, you have guided us to ask for what we need. Our Lord Jesus called his disciples to live as a city on a hill and a lamp on a stand that all may see the glory of God. Help us to shine forth. We pray for the church, the community of disciples. Grant that we who claim the name of Christ may shine, may shine as light into our dark world. Our brother Paul led the church not by lofty words of human wisdom, but by wisdom born of your spirit, Pray for those who serve the church. Let our pastors, teachers, and those who minister in the name of Christ be led by your truth. Blessed are those who honor your commandments, O oh Lord. We pray for our world, for the governments, and for its leaders. May all who rule honor justice and compassion and serve the common good you teach us to offer food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted. We pray for the sick, the hungry, the poor, the homeless, and those who are oppressed. We lift up to you in prayer this day, Willie Banks' granddaughter Minnie, May your healing spirit be upon her and bring her to a place of wholeness and recovery. Comfort her in her pain and surround her loved ones with your peace. And now we pause for a moment of silence to lift up to you our personal prayers for those we carry in our hearts and for those who this congregation has been asked to pray. church minister to those in distress and be bear witness to your abiding compassion for all who suffer. God of grace and compassion, we pray for all our brothers and sisters whose daily lives are affected by violence, discrimination, racism, and hatred. Help us to expand our vision that we might release that we might release our need for privilege and instead seek to honor you as we serve all people, recognizing that all people are made in your image. May we glorify you in all that we do. We pray for those whose lives are devastated by fire and hurricane and flood and wind. We pray that the resources that are needed will come forth quickly their suffering and restore their lives. Draw close to those in need of your comfort. Bless them with faith, hope, and courage for the days ahead. We pray for all those who are on the front lines of these disasters. Firefighters, police, EMTs, disaster relief volunteers, and medical personnel. Guide their efforts, dear Lord, and surround them with your protecting arms. Give them strength, energy, and wisdom to do the work that is before them. And we pray, Almighty God, for the people of Lebanon, for the Parkers, and for all the teams of aid workers who are helping to restore food, shelter, and health care to the people there. May the resources they are desperately in need 
data arrive quickly and be distributed equitably. Show us how we can be generous in our support. We pray for the departed, especially we pray this day for Verna May, Reverend Bob Gerard's mother, and Ruth Bader Ginsburg. We celebrate lives lived well. We rejoice that they have returned to the place of their consecration and now rejoice in the company of the saints. Wrap your comforting arms around those who mourn. Give them hope and the peace that surpasses all understanding. Keep alive in us the hope of your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Into your hands we commend those who we pray, for whom we pray, trusting thy will be done in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray to you, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation.
benediction, I'm going to invite you just to sit down and remain seated through the post-salute until you are excused and we have our congregation meeting. And now go out into the world, letting your light shine, that others may see God's glory. Now may God bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace, now and forever.